But look what happened to Robin Hood from its peak to its trough. Wasn't that pretty obvious that something like that was going to happen? Robin Hood, when they came out and went public and oh. got alerted on everybody and all the short-term gambling and big commissions and hidden kickbacks and so on and so on. It was disgusting. Yeah. And it says the last year and they got mad at you and they sold a bunch of their stock and they got the money and... Yeah, but now they're, it's unraveling. Yeah. God, God is getting just. But a lot of the insiders have right, gotten, no, but they've gotten a lot of money from it. I mean, they were big sellers, as I remember. That may be, but yeah. there's, a, there's been some justice. There's all kinds of people watching this that are long Bitcoin and there's nobody that's short. And nobody, nobody wants their windpipe stepped on. I don't blame them. I don't like people to step on my windpipe. But I would say this that if all the people this if the people in this room owned all of the farmland in the United States and you offered me a 1% interest in it and you said for a 1% interest in all the farmland in the United States pay us this bargain price 25 billion dollars I'll write you a check this afternoon 25 billion now I own 1% of the farmland if you tell me you own 1% of the apartment houses in the United States, and you offer me a 1% interest, so I'll have a 1% interest in all the apartment houses in the country, and you want whatever it may be for another $25 billion or something, I'll write you a check. You know, it's very simple. Now, if you told me you owned all of the Bitcoin in the world, and you offered it to me for $25. I wouldn't take it because what would I do with it? Um, I have to sell it back to you one way or another. I mean, maybe I'd be the same people, but it isn't going to do anything. The apartments are going to produce rental, and, and the farms are going to produce food. And uh, uh, if I've got all the Bitcoin, you know, I'm back where whatever his name was, who may or may not have existed, was. You know, 15 years ago. If I've got it all, he could create a mystery about it. But everybody knows what I'm like. I mean, so if I'm trying to get rid of it, you know, people will say, well, uh, you know, why should I buy some Bitcoin from you? <laughs> I mean, why don't you call it Buffett coin? You know, make your own or something. What? Do something. But uh, I'm not going to give you anything for it. And you'd be right, incidentally. But that explains the difference between productive assets and something that depends on the next guy paying you more than the last guy got. Now, net, if you look at it, a lot of commissions have been paid, and there's, I mean, there's all kinds of frictional costs that are very real that somebody has paid to a bunch of people who facilitate this game. But whatever one group of the public has taken out, or one group of owners, has come in from other people. I mean, it's other people have entered the room and they move money around, but but no money has, there's no more money in the room. It just changed hands with a lot of maybe fraud and costs involved and, you know, a whole bunch of things you lose, you know, you forget the numbers or forget the equation. You can do that with a lot of things. I mean, it's been done throughout history. Certain things have value that produce something tangible. I mean, you can, you can say a great painting, you know, probably will have some value 500 years from now. May not, but the odds are pretty good that if it was a big enough name at some point, there'll be a few things. I mean, it, you know, you can, uh, you can find something pretty, if somebody wants to sell you a pyramid or something and you can charge the viewers or, you know, It'll be around a long time and, and won't produce anything, but 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 uh, people will find it interesting to go there because I've read about the pyramids. But basically, uh, assets to be to have value, they have to deliver something to somebody, and uh, uh, and there's only one currency that's acceptable in the United States. I mean, you can you can come up with all kinds of things. Uh, we can put up Berkshire coins or, you know, we can put up Berkshire money or anything like that. But uh, we get in trouble, I guess, if we call it money. But uh, 
in the end, this is money, and, and there's no reason in the world why the United States government, whose currency people prefer, I mean, we, literally there's 2.3, just under 2.3 trillion just of these little pieces of paper floating around some places, 7,000 for every man, woman, and child in the United States, and of course most of them probably aren't in the United States, who knows, but this is the only thing that's money. And anybody that thinks the United States is going to change the way they let Berkshire money replace theirs, you know, is out of their mind. I mean, and, uh, uh, so anyway, uh, with those few deficiencies, whether it goes up or down in the next year or five years, 10 years, I don't know. But the one thing I'm pretty sure of is that it, it doesn't, it doesn't multiply, it doesn't produce anything. It's, it's, uh, it's got a magic to it, and people have attached magics to lots of things. I mean, the gold in Wall Street, you know, create magic, you know. you know. We are not an insurance company, we're a tech company. Well, they're an insurance company, but a dozen people or so have raised a lot of money. They just say, just don't pay any attention to the fact that we sell insurance. We are a tech company. Well, in the end, they wrote insurance and government of China has worried the investors from the United States who invest in China more in recent months and years than he did in earlier periods. Uh, so there's been some tension and it's affected the prices of some of the Chinese stocks, particularly inter uh, internet stocks. Just in the last day or two, the Chinese leader has sort of reversed course on that and said he went, went too far and he's going to pull way back and so on and so on. So we're having some hopeful signs. But yes, there are more difficulties invest in, I mean, of dealing with the regime in China than there are in the United States. And it's different. It's a long way away and they've got their own culture and their own loyalties and so on and so on. The reason that I invested in China is I could get so much more so, so much better companies at so, so much lower prices, and I was willing to take a little political risk to get them to get into the better companies at the lower prices. Other people might reach the opposite conclusion. My question is on market timing. You have always said that it is impossible to time the markets. Yet, if we look at your track record, you have had amazing timings with some of your key decisions. You got out of the stock markets in 1969-70. You got back in 72, 72, 74, when the markets were really cheap. You did the same thing in 87, 99, 2000. And today, we are sitting on a significant amount of cash when the markets are going down. My question is, how do you time the big market moves so well? Uh We'd like to offer you a job first. Uh, <laughs> I will take it. <laughs> the, uh, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, obviously, we haven't the faintest idea what the stock market is going to do when it opens on Monday. We never have had. We have never made, Charlie and I, I don't think, in all the time we've worked together, and I'll tell you something later on, maybe about how learning takes place, but we have... We have never, I don't think we've ever made a decision that where either one of us has either said or been thinking we should buy or sell based on what the market is going to do. Uh, no. Or, or for that matter, on, on what the economy is going to do. We, we don't know. And the interesting thing is, some, sometimes I get some credit someplace for the fact that, you know, how wonderful it was that... We were optimistic in 2008 and when everybody was down on stocks and all that sort of thing. You know, we, we, we spent a big percentage of our net worth at a very dumb time. <laughs> and and I, I shouldn't say we, it's I. We spent about 15 or $16 billion, which was a lot bigger to us then than it is now. We spent it in the last few weeks, there was a period of three or four weeks, between Wrigley and Goldman Sachs and General, we, at a terrible time, 
as it turned out, I mean, I, I didn't think, I didn't know whether it was going to be a good time or a bad time, but it was a really dumb time. And I wrote an article for the New York Times and Buy America and, and all these things. Well, if I'd had any sense of timing and waited six months until, I think the low was in March, and in fact, um, I think I was on CNBC maybe that day or something, but, but uh, I totally missed that opportunity. I totally missed, you know, in March of, of, of 2000, 2020. Uh, uh, we, 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 we have not been good at timing. We have, we have been reasonably good at figuring out when we were getting enough for our money. And we had, no, had no idea when we bought anything. Well, we always hoped it would go down for a while so we could buy more. And we hoped even after we were done buying and ran out of money that if it was cheap, the company would keep buying, in effect, taking our interest up. I mean, that's stuff you could, you could learn it in fourth grade, but it's not what's taught in school. And, I mean, it, it, so never give us any credit. Well, actually, give us all the credit. I mean, go out and tell everybody how smart we are, but we aren't. <laughs> we haven't ever timed anything. We've never figured out insights into the economy. When I was 11 years old, March, March 12th, I guess, 1942, yeah, at, uh, March 11th, you know, that I bought stock when the Dow was 90, well, it was 101 in the morning. It was 99 at the end of the day, I think. And, uh, you know, now it's 34,000 or in the last couple of years, the stock market is probably, it's always been a combination of a casino and a, uh, and when I talk about Wall Street, I'm talking about the whole capital formation market. Uh, but the, and, and trading market, et cetera. But the market has been extraordinary. It, it, Sometimes it's it's quite investment oriented, kind of like it always you read about in the books and everything. Uh, what capital markets are supposed to do, and you study it in school and all that. And other times it's 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 almost totally uh, a casino, and uh, it's a gambling parlor. And that existed to an extraordinary degree. Uh, in the last couple of years, encouraged by Wall Street because the money is in, the money is, turn, is in turning over stocks. I mean, people say how wonderful you've done if you bought Berkshire in, the, in you know, 1965 or something and, and held it. But your broker would have starved to death. I mean, it, 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 it's, Wall Street makes money on, on one way or another, catching the crumbs that fall off a table of capitalism and, and an incredible economy that, that you know, nobody could have ever dreamed of a couple hundred years ago. They don't make money unless people do things <laughs> and that they get a piece of them. And they make a lot more money when people are gambling than when they're investing. I mean, it, uh, it's much better to have somebody that's going to trade 20 times a day and get all excited about it, just like paying, pulling the handle on the slot machine. You may not say that you'd want that person. You'd like the other kind of person too, maybe, but that's where you make the money. <laughs> Bonds can swindle the equity investor to everything. Uh, 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 and inflation, I should say, swindles the, the bond investor too. It swindles the person who keeps their cash under their mattress. It swindles almost everybody. The problem, if you have a business that doesn't take any capital, and let's just say the dollar depreciates 90% or something, so things cost 10 times as much. If it doesn't take any capital, you can charge 10 times as much, and you've kept your relative position. But most businesses take some capital. If our utility business, just to say that the dollar is worth one-tenth uh, some years hence from now, we have to have 10 times the capital investment, basically. And we get paid a return on that, but we have forced capital investment. Uh, to, essentially keep them in the same place. And uh, I wrote an article related to that, and I will tell you a very one famous story, which you will all sympathize with, in that I wrote that story for Fortune, and when I finished it, it was about 7,000 words. And Fortune doesn't 
didn't like publishing 7,000 words, and they had my friend Carol Loomis explain that to me, knowing that I would pay more attention to her than anybody else, but being stubborn and male, I said, uh, uh, you know, every word is precious, and they can either run it or not. So then they sent an editor, a very nice guy, out to Omaha, and this guy explained to me that just wasn't right to use that many words. And uh, I said, well, that's fine, but if you don't do it, I'll write it someplace else or something. Very disgusting behavior on my part. And then I sent it, it was, it was beginning to bother me a little. So I sent it to my friend Meg Greenfield, and Meg was a great, great, great editor at the Washington Post, and we were very, very good friends wonderful woman. And Meg, who was tough as nails with most writers, but she was kind of nice. She was, she didn't want to really hurt me too much. So she said, I said, well, Meg, what do you think? And she said, well, Warren, she says, you don't have to tell everything you know in this article. <laughs> and and it, it, uh, it made, it made the point. And so I write that letter, I write that article shorter and uh, but I'd say more or less the, the same thing. No, it, you're better off if you really could have a totally stable unit of a monetary uh, use for the next hundred years. It would be better better for business and investors in general. Well, it, it happened on a scale this time we'd never seen before. Those checks that were just mailed out to everybody who claimed to have a business and claimed to have employees, they, they, they probably drowned the country in money for a while. And, they, and as you say, they probably had to do it. But it, it was something that had never been done on that scale before. But we had a problem we hadn't had before. Yes. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't a good no, idea. It, I mean, in my book, Jay Powell's a hero. I mean, it's very, very simple. I mean, he did what he had to do. You know, when, when uh, if he had done nothing, it would be the, I mean, he would be, be very easy to engage in what you would call thumb sucking then. And plenty of, I shouldn't say plenty of, but there are other Fed chairmen that would have been sucking their thumbs and the world would have fallen around them. Is we will always have a lot of cash on hand. And when I say cash, I don't mean commercial paper, when 2008 and 2009 financial panic came along, we didn't own anybody's commercial paper. Yeah, we didn't have money market funds. We didn't. We have treasury bills. We believe in having cash, and uh, have been a few times in history, and will be more times in history where, where if you don't have it, you know, you don't get to play the next day. I mean, it, uh, it's like oxygen, you know. It's there all the time, but if it disappears for a few minutes, it's all over. So we, our cash was down on March 31st because, as you saw, we spent that large sum uh, there in that brief period during the quarter, $40 billion. Uh, we've committed to buy Allegheny Corp. for something over $11 billion. and uh, But we will always have a lot of cash. We won't. We don't. Some of our companies have bank, bank lines. I don't know why they have the bank lines. We're better than the banks, and we, we'll give them the money if they need it. But, but you know, the local bankers have been calling on them, and they, uh, they need something to do. Everybody else has bank lines, so uh, it, it's harmless. Uh, but our, there's no reason for any of our subsidiaries uh, to have bank lines. Berkshire is stronger than the banks that they're... Uh, I didn't hear exactly what... I don't know what that was a... Banker screaming, or <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't really like to torture. I don't like to torture anybody. I mean, <laughs> but, but uh, money's kind of an interesting thing. But, uh, people seem to like to talk to me about it. I mean, they don't, they don't ask me how to dance or anything like that. But they do. They ask about money, and so twenty one. It's a photo of a twenty dollar bill. And it says at the top, Federal Reserve notes. Now, Federal Reserve note, we, we've done all kinds of things with money in this country. It's amazing 
country only a couple hundred years old, the number of different experiments we've made with banks and everything. But we finally just decided to put, let the Federal Reserve do the issuing of money down in the lower left-hand corner. Incidentally, I think Rosie Rios, uh, who signed this note, I think she signed more more uh, U.S. currency than, than uh, any other person in history. Uh, so if you see Rosie, you know, you cozy up to her. I mean, this is a woman that has issued a lot of currency. Uh, uh, but it says this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. And that makes it money. You, you can go in, go into our candy store, and if you offer us enough bushels of wheat, we'll probably give you a box of candy. But, but money is the only thing that the IRS is going to take from you. It, it, uh, you can offer them paintings, you can offer them all, whatever, but this is what settles debts in the United States. And I thought that you'll hear a lot about various kinds of money. This is the only kind of money uh, you're going to see, uh, in my opinion, uh, throughout your lifetime or even throughout Charlie's lifetime.